Hey everybody, so working in a large company with so many BCBAs, it's interesting to see how many people are passing their boards. And one of the things that we're noticing as administrative staff are the amount of hours that people are spending passing their boards or studying to pass their boards, right? They're reading articles, they're on Instagram, they're looking for all kinds of things to help them. And that's fantastic. But what happens when you finally actually pass your boards? What articles or what resources are people looking at to help them become effective analysts in the field. So one of the things that I was thinking about are what articles do we have? And I was able to come up with five from behavior analysis and practice that I think every new BCBA or BCABA should be reading to help them get started boots on the ground right away. So let's talk about what these five articles are and how you can use them every day. Hey everybody, so my name is Pierre Lewis. I'm a board certified behavior analyst. And in this video for Hacking ABA, I wanna to talk to you about five articles that I think every brand new behavior analyst or assistant behavior analyst should read to get them ready to go in the field. So the first article I picked is from 2018. Again, it's from Behavior Analysis and Practice. And it's called, How to Identify Ethical Practices in Organizations Prior to Employment. So why is this important? It's important because as soon as you pass your boards, you're gonna be inundated with job offers and people are gonna be asking you to come in and interview. And it's important as a new analyst that you're asking the right types of questions to make sure that you are set up in an ethical environment. What do I specifically like about this article? There's a table that tells you kind of, what are some of the questions I can ask? How does the organization support my access to behavior analytic literature? That's important because you want to make sure that you're continuing your growth. Describe how the organization supports ethical practices. That's really important. That's something you want to make sure you ask. How will the company support my ongoing professional development and supervision? So you might be thinking that you're going to ask questions about your pay and reimbursement and mileage and all those things are important but you wanna make sure that you're also finding out how the organization is going to support you as an ongoing professional, especially as a new professional. Okay, the second article I'm picking is called Planning and Leading Effective Meetings. That's right, there's actually an article in Behavior Analysis and Practice on how to plan and lead effective meetings. I'll tell you right now, when I was in grad school, nobody taught me the importance of how to run a meeting, right? And as a behavior analyst, you're going to be meeting with parents, you're going to be meeting with school district personnel and all types of other people. So it's important that you know how to run a meeting as an analyst. Let's talk about what that looks like. So you may think you know why it's important to have a meeting or what the important elements of a meeting are. But think about this. In the article, there's an appendix and I love it. It talks about what's the purpose of the meeting? Do I need to actually be having this meeting in the first place? How often should I be having this meeting? How many times have you been in a meeting and you're wondering to yourself, do we need to be having this every Tuesday? Maybe the answer is no. How about this one? Who are the critical participants who should be in this meeting? You might be in a meeting where there's 30 people, but there should really be five or six. How do you open the meeting? How do you manage the meeting? Who's going to take notes? How are you going to close the meeting? And then questions to ask yourself at the end of the meeting. I guarantee you, if you read this article, you will be so happy because you will know how to actually plan and lead an effective meeting as an analyst. And I guarantee you with the amount of time you spend in one, you'll be happy you did that. Okay, article number three is about self-care. And I know that's a big topic in the field right now. It seems to be a buzzword, but I also think it's really important. And so right here in 2021, Julie Slowiak has an article called Self-Care Strategies and Job Crafting Practices Among Behavior Analysts. Do they predict perceptions of work-life balance, work engagement, and burnout? So why is this important? I think as a brand new analyst, you're gonna wanna get going on your cases. You're gonna wanna start to make money. You're gonna wanna start to help people. You're gonna wanna start to build your career. It's just as important for you to be thinking about self-care. Start these practices early. Are your jobs providing an environment for you where you can feel safe, secure, and that your workload is manageable so you can not only help people but also make sure that you're not burning out in the field. So I highly recommend this article for you if you're a new analyst. 
All right, article number four, also in behavior analysis and practice, is titled Soft Skills, the Case for Compassionate Approaches or How Behavior Analyst Keeps Finding Its Heart. I'm pretty sure if you're an analyst and you went through a grad program, you probably didn't get a course on soft skills. Although I'm hearing that more and more analysts are starting to talk about it, so maybe by the time you're actually seeing this, you can say, oh, I'm one of the people who did get that. But if you didn't, it's important for you as, an, as a new analyst to really brush up or work on these skills. Having all of the book knowledge is great, but if you're not able to talk to people, parents, school personnel, and people in other fields about our science, nobody's gonna wanna listen to you. So let me just walk you through a couple of the key points in this article that I think will be crazy important for you. So the article has table one and it's called the Compassionate Collaboration Tool. Highly recommend that you take a look at this. Listen to some of these points that they mention in the article. Did the clinician incorporate family or individual client input when identifying objectives or procedures? Did you discuss the rationale for selected targets? Did you ensure that the rationale is aligned with the family's input? Did you use precise everyday language? Really important. Did you avoid terms that may have negative connotations such as extinction or discrimination? So this is an excellent table. If you don't read the entire article and you just look at this table, I guarantee you, you'll feel better that you did. All new analysts need to make sure that they have the appropriate soft skills to not only be able to work with families, but to also disseminate the science in an effective way. And the last article I picked is one that I've actually talked about three or four times at this point, and I actually had the pleasure of having this person um, in on one of my talks when I was speaking about their research, and it's called Cultural Humility in the Practice of Applied Behavior Analysis, and it's from Patricia L. Wright. Why do I love this article and why do I think that all new analysts should read it? It's important because it's not only a buzzword right now, it's something that next year the ethics code has actually added into the code to make sure that we're actually practicing this. So let's talk about why it's important. So the article talks about things like people's cultural identities, how those cultural identities shape their worldviews, how do my views as an analyst potentially impact the way I program for somebody that I'm serving? Those are very important things that every new analyst needs to be aware of. And again, I picked an article that has a fantastic table that you can take a look at. So let's talk about some of the things from this table. So on an individual level, here are some questions you can ask yourself. What are my cultural identities? How much do I value input from my clients? What do I learn about myself through listening to clients who are different than me? On an institutional level, how do we organizationally define culture and diversity? How does our hiring practice reflect a commitment to a diverse staff and leadership? What social and economic barriers affect the client's ability to receive effective care? So as a new analyst, you might be thinking that it's important to ask about what the family wants in terms of goals, but it's also important that you're aware of how your worldview may impact the types of questions you ask in the first place. All right, so those are my five articles for every brand new BCBA. I'm sure there's more. I'm sure there's five more that you can think of, especially if you're a seasoned analyst, but those are the five that I think are really important for all new analysts. Okay, so if you are subscribed to our channel, good for you. If you're not, we need you to be subscribed. Why? Every week we're putting out behavior analytic content in a lot of different areas. We're gonna have things to help you study for your exam, but we're also gonna have cool things like this, teaching you how to be an effective leader. We're gonna have stuff on animal training, and then we're gonna show things like journal clubs and also what it looks like to have behind the scenes meetings. All the types of things I kind of talked today in the article. So hit subscribe and then share the content, not only with somebody who's practicing to become a BCBA, but somebody already in the field and somebody you think would just benefit from one of these cool topics that we're talking about every week. We'll see you next time.